I want to welcome you to, this is our second year of our Reformation 500 program. Uh, we started in 2012, this is 2013, we're planning each year to have two presentations, one in the fall, one in the spring. Looking forward to the big 500th anniversary of the Reformation in uh, the fall of 2017. So again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, next spring, we're going to be having another presentation uh, by Dr. Harries is going to be doing something on, I'm not quite certain, but the book and the Reformation. Uh, the details will be coming. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Barker's wife, uh, Kathleen Crowther, will be doing a presentation also here at noon. So if you want to come back, a different presentation tomorrow at noon uh, with, with Dr. Crowther. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to just introduce Dr. Manoj, who will then introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Mashke. And uh, this is a wonderful privilege to have uh, Dr. Peter Barker on our uh, campus uh, for a long time. I've been very interested in the history, philosophy, and theology of science. And in fact, in 2001, we had a speaker series here at Concordia on the vocation of scientists. And it was suggested after we had that series that we would do a book on the topic. So I was reading around on uh, many authors, and I came across a really, I think, stunning essay by Peter Barker, who I'd never heard of uh, before, uh, which Dr. Mobley uh, also uh, knew about. It was in the History of Science uh, journal, Osiris. And you think, well, History of Science, that's going to be fairly uh, dry and detailed stuff and all the rest of it. Well, the essay was called Theological Foundations of Capitalist Astronomy. And going into it and finding out the depth of the essay, many people have made these comments about capitalist Christian faith and how they integrated it, but just the level at which it was done, the specific theological convictions growing out of the Reformation that inspired and guided his work in astronomy. So then, as I was adding contributors to the subsequent uh, book, this is the, the book that we did, Reading God's World, okay, uh, The Scientific Vocation, um, I invited uh, Dr. Barker to contribute an essay, which he, which he very graciously uh, did, Astronomy, Providence, and the Lutheran Contribution to Science. So, when we were thinking of speakers for our five-year celebration, which Dr. Mashke just mentioned, uh, of the anniversary of the Reformation. I thought of Peter, uh, particularly because our school has grown so much in the area of sciences, and it may be that there are many people who do specialized work in the sciences today who are not aware of this profound interaction between Reformation theology and uh, science. Um, and we are so grateful to learn that as well that it, it, this will be a twofer, not only Dr. Peter Barker, but also Kathleen Crowler, who is going to be speaking tomorrow on her uh, topic of a fabulous new book, Adam and Eve in the Protestant Reformation, which, by the way, is available for sale in the bank uh, tonight and will also be available tomorrow and subsequently in the, in the bookstore. Ex excellent book. Uh, I'll just give you a little background on Peter. Uh, Dr. Barker is uh, the professor of the history of science at the University of Oklahoma. He's the author of more than 50 scholarly articles, six edited collections, and two books. Most recently, The Cognitive Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Cambridge University Press. And his research and teaching cover the entire history of the Western scientific tradition from the Greeks to the present, with special attention to the early modern period of the 20th century. And Particularly, he's done some really fine work on science in the uh, Reformation. He's held many uh, distinguished appointments in Europe and the US. He is, in fact, uh, Anglo-Danish. Um, and he's just a wonderful scholar. And currently, he is the associate editor of Centaurus, the official journal of the European Society for the History of Science. Uh, so. Uh, without further ado, we welcome Dr. Peter Bach. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? People in the back? Is this a reasonable level? I see people nodding. Thank you. Um, 
So, uh, to begin with, um, I'd like to um, express a very profound thanks to Angus Manoogian for a very kind introduction, uh, to um, Dean Stone for, I think, providing the resources, and to the uh, Reformation 500 group for inviting both me and uh, my wife, who is uh, an independent scholar, uh, but also um, my most important collaborator. What she's talking about tomorrow has nothing at all to do with what I'm talking about tonight. But just to give you an idea, um, it's things that you never heard about Adam and Eve and how early Lutherans used them to spread their own ideas. So, um, what am I doing? Uh, well, to begin with, we've got the screensaver, um, which is about the largest things in the world. These are the largest things in the world if you're a student at Wittenberg when Luther's there. Um, what I really want to talk about tonight is the Lutheran contribution to the astronomical revolution. That's the part of the scientific revolution when a universe like this, with the Earth in the middle and the Sun going around the Earth and everything else going around the Earth as well, was replaced by the universe we now think we live in. A universe in which, well, the Sun isn't the center, but at least it's the center of the planetary motions and the planetary system that we live in. The Earth is just another planet. That big change is the astronomical revolution. What I want to tell you tonight, as quickly as I can, is a story involving as many Lutherans as I can. Because one of the things that I found when I started investigating this topic historically was first that there were an unusually large number of Lutherans involved, and secondly, that it was their Lutheran religious views which directly influenced their support of the new science. So, Many people have heard of the warfare thesis, the traditional, actually it's only traditional since the 19th century, view that uh, science and religion are natural antagonists. I think this is um, very naive, probably indefensible as a general historical generalization, and what I'm going to be presenting this evening is one of the prime counterexamples, how Lutheran Christianity uh, specifically aided the development of the transition from an Earth-centered cosmos to a Sun-centered cosmos. So, um, yeah, before I go away from this, just one last thing. I'm going to use the word eccentrics and epicycles a good deal. Eccentrics are these off-center circles. They're not quite centered on the center of the cosmos. And these things going around are epicycles. Embedded in them are planets. Um, the main point of the epicycle in this Earth-centered cosmos is to make the planet occasionally, from the viewpoint of the Earth, go backwards. This one's just starting to do that now. Mm. That's interesting. Um, let's see if I can wake it up again. Right. So um, let's uh, get on with the main business and uh, not let the machine go to sleep. Again. Um, so I need to get out of this. Bring up um, this same thing, which is the beginning of. Okay, so the first picture you're going to see is the same universe, um, only this is the whole universe, starting from the Earth, with all of the planets going out. So we have the Moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars in this conspicuous red band. Jupiter and Saturn, and that's all there is, because at this point in history, no more have been discovered. That's the other thing to hang on to, because that'll be important in a moment. Um, so here is roughly what I'm going to talk about, as quickly as possible, to get through as much as I can. Um, I need to tell you a little bit about the cosmos before Copernicus, the name associated with the transition to the, uh, the new view. How the Lutherans actually rescued him, I'll have to do that rather quickly, but it's a good story and one that I know bits of that other people don't. Um, what Copernicus tried to do to change the cosmos, and um, uh, how that didn't really work. Um, how two important Lutherans then also tried to change the cosmos. First Tycho Brahe, who's Danish, and then Johannes Kepler, who was um, German. And um, as Angus already advertised, um, I'm going to be telling you how Kepler believed, quite sincerely and with good reasons, that he had literally discovered God's plan for the cosmos. 
So, um, very briefly then, what's the cosmos before Copernicus like? Okay. Um, the reason I'm showing you these pictures is to give you the impression that the entire cosmos is full of something. What it's full of are concentric orbs, like the layers of an onion. The planets are embedded in epicycle spheres, and the epicycle spheres are embedded in the orbs. The whole thing rotates, like the animation we were watching at the beginning. Um, in the secondary sources, you'll often see the period of astronomy before Copernicus described as one in which there were uh, tremendous observational problems. That's basically false. Um, there were problems with astronomy at this moment. Um, there was an internal problem called the equal problem, which I'll talk about very briefly. The worst problem was the criticism by uh, people outside technical astronomy, natural philosophers, followers of Aristotle, specifically followers of uh, Aristotle's most important commentator, Averroes. In astronomy itself, wonderful things were happening. Um, in 1475, to pick a reasonable date, a good place to start, uh, George Purbach in Germany had published a new textbook on astronomy. Um, what was new about it was his consistent use of this orb construction to explain the motion of the planets. So the book begins, the sun has three orbs. And you can see how important he thinks these are from the size of the figure on the first page. All of the planetary models start with figures on this scale. It's a little bit difficult to see what it is that we're looking at. So here is an exploded view. Um, this then is a cross section. The sun is being carried around by this collection of orbs. The inner one corresponds to the inner shaded section there. Um, the white orb isn't just a gap or a space between the two dark ones. It's actually a full solid object. Um, actually, the only orb in here that's regular. Um, and then this is the outer orb. Um, the whole thing fits together, as I said, leaving no empty space. The sun is embedded in the middle one. And as this collection of things rotates, it carries the sun around the Earth once a year and does various other things. Um, this system um, of astronomy is based on the work of Claudius Ptolemy, who I'm not going to talk about, um, except to say that um, it's very successful predictively. Um, if you were content with naked eye observation, you could use this system today and you'd never be uh, um, dissatisfied with it. If there was a problem, it was an internal one, uh, which I mentioned. Um, the question is, what's the axis around which these orbs rotate? The most natural way of understanding the picture on the extreme side of the screen is that the, they're all rotating about an axis coming straight out of the screen at you. So in perspective, the middle orb, which is the important one, would have an axis through its natural center. Unfortunately, Ptolemy's models require that the axis be not there, but off center. And it's not clear that this makes any physical sense at all. So that's the equant problem. Um, it had actually been solved for several centuries by astronomers in Islam, but it had never been solved in Europe until Copernicus came along. Um, the uh, uh, rest of the details, this is the picture we were just looking at. Um, we use then the off-center white circles called eccentrics. Here they're shown in several different colors the different planets. This is the eccentric for Mars. Here's a more obvious eccentric for Jupiter, in which instead of embedding the body of the sun, you embed an orb with the planet stuck in it, um, like a raisin in a muffin. And um, as the whole thing rotates, they make the, the correct planetary motions. Now, um, this view that orbs were real um, swept uh, Europe. It started with Albertus de Brzeva in Krakow, um, who's important because Krakow was the first university that Copernicus attended, and Brzeva was the astronomer who was in control of the curriculum when Copernicus was there. Here's what Brzeva says about what we've just been looking at. The sun doesn't move in a circle, which is a plain figure, but as things truly are, in an orb, which is a body that's solid and spherical. So, when you go to Wittenberg, 
uh, in um, 1540, you're going to be taught astronomy. It's a required course. Everybody has to take it. And you're going to be taught that the universe is completely full. It's full of orbs like this. They rotate in the way that we were just looking at, and that's what moves the planets. Now, if you go elsewhere, you may hear different things. Um, Aristotle's most important commentator, Averroes, who lived in Spain in the 13th century, um, bitterly objected to um, all of the uh, me mechanisms we've just been talking about, particularly the things I was calling eccentrics and epicycles, because they have centers of rotation which are not identical to the center of the Earth. The equant was another problem, had a center, of, in, in effect, imposing a center of rotation different from the center of the Earth. And um, Averroes was a long time before the period we're talking about. But his work was so important um, that, uh, again, if you were studying Aristotle, you'd probably study Averroes at the same time. We have books at the University of Oklahoma where both authors are printed together, um, page on page. Um, Averroes has extremely influential followers, particularly in Italy. Uh, this is Alessandro Accolini, who publishes a book on the orbs in Bologna in 1498. This is actually while Copernicus is a student in Bologna studying astronomy. In that book, Accolini attacks the entire system that I've just shown you um, and says it can't be right. It's physically defective on the grounds that um, uh, Averroes said it requires rotations about centers which are not the center of the Earth. Um, very few technical astronomers ever accepted this. The only really good example I've ever found, and I want to emphasize this is a tiny minority, was this guy, Silvestro Mazzolini da Prierio, who I suspect is familiar to the theologians present. In addition to writing a commentary on the ast astronomy that we've just been talking about, he also, um, by 1515, had ascended to the position of uh, Master of the Sacred Palace in the papal hierarchy. Now, it's worth spending a moment trying to explain what that means. Um, if the Pope was the President of the United States, the Master of the Sacred Palace might be something like his National Security Advisor. So, um, the Master of the Sacred Palace is really the Pope's personal advisor on theology, the most sensitive subject he deals with. And uh, it was this guy, uh, De Pierio, who um, was given Luther's theses to write a theological opinion on, and wrote a very negative opinion. In many respects, we could say then that the Reformation got going because this guy didn't give a more gracious response to Luther. He also gave an ungracious response to the astronomical theories I've been talking about. This is the same as the opening sentences of the other books we've been looking at, but notice how he hesitates. Uh, therefore, the sun has, well, that is, it's believed to have three orbs, but this isn't demonstrated, but thought up in order to say what appears in the celestial motions. It turns out this guy is uh, a closet of Erebus, and um, he's not part of the technical mainstream in astronomy. Um, a much better example of the technical mainstream is this guy, another Italian, um, who says quite simply that uh, eccentric orbs are the origin without which it's impossible to do astronomy. Um, his book was reprinted up to times, tremendously popular, and also contained a specific rebuttal of the Averroists. So, uh, Cosmos before Copernicus. This new astronomical theory, the new Theorica, displaced the old theory. The theory with orbs displaces the theory without orbs by 1531. It happens all over Europe, Poland, France, Italy. Um, the commentators on Kurbach, the people I've been giving you snippets from, all follow him in accepting that celestial orbs are real. And they don't really have anything to say about the equant. It's an unaddressed problem. Which brings us to the man who solved the equant problem, and a lot of other problems, but very nearly didn't solve anything at all. To explain how the Lutherans rescued Copernicus then, we need to dive right into the Reformation and talk about uh, Luther's right-hand man and chief diplomat, Philip Melanchthon. Um, Melanchthon was recruited at Wittenberg uh, right around the time that Luther produced the theses. Um, he was the professor of Greek, um, during the 1520s, he became indispensable to Luther as a diplomat, and he, ended, he was actually the author of the Augsburg Confession, 
the, um, the first systematic exposition of, of Lutheran belief. Um, while Luther concentrated on theology, um, Melanchthon concentrated more on um, running the university, Wittenberg, and later reforming other Lutheran universities, other Protestant universities. However, in the 1520s, um, Luther and Melanchthon um, had a problem. Uh, the problem was revolting peasants. Um, between 1524 and 1526, peasant revolts broke out all over the German-speaking part of Europe. Um, and these peasants were saying things that were embarrassingly like the things that Luther and Melanchthon were saying. Um, they wanted to uh, control their own congregations. Uh, they wanted to have some say in who their ministers were. Uh, they wanted to be able to read the Bible for themselves and um, uh, make up their own minds about it. Um, and unfortunately, they also wanted to right some long-standing wrongs. For example, uh, the um, oppression of the wealthy landowners. Um, they dispossessed many wealthy landowners in extremely violent and indeed often murderous ways. Luther and Melanchthon found it essential to distance themselves from the peasant rebellion. Um, this is sometimes called the magister magisterial reform of Lutheranism. It's when Lutheranism aligns itself with the temporal powers in Germany that already exist, the princes who are running the German states that they're living in. Um, it was left to Melanchthon to construct an intellectual defense for this maneuver, and in doing so, he fell back on um, a piece of philosophical uh, <coughs> commonplace. This was common philosophical property, not just the property of Lutherans, but he used it in a way which was unique. Um, so in um, 1526 through this book, 1532, he talks about um, philosophy not being gospel, which is of course what Luther's the expert on, uh, nor any part of it, but rather part of divine law. So if you've studied Lutheran theology, you're familiar with this distinction between law and gospel. Melanchthon is constructing a defense of Lutheranism against the peasant revolts using the side of law. Um, for philosophy is the law of nature itself divinely written on men's minds. Okay. Um, philosophy, properly speaking, is nothing other than the explanation of these laws of nature. And um, um, I call philosophy not all of men's opinions, but the sure perceptions and those which can be demonstrated. The idea of uh, a natural law that Melanchthon is appealing to here is different from the modern concept of natural law. Melanchthon's concept is um, a principle, as he says, um, inscribed on the human soul, divinely written um, on men's minds. And um, it consists of two main resources. On the one hand, there are ethical principles, those govern the human world. On the other hand, there are um, what we would call scientific principles, particularly mathematical principles, things like triangles have three sides, or Mars revolves in two years. The connection between the two is important. Um, it's the ethical principles that Melanchthon wants to use to justify the Lutherans separating themselves from the peasant revolt. Thus, these ethical principles are supposed to show you that what the peasants are doing is um, wrong. But um, unfortunately, not everybody agrees that in this case, theft is wrong. There's by no means universal agreement on some of these ethical principles. So Melanchthon needs something of the same sort, on which there's no disagreement. Nobody disagrees about triangles having three sides. Um, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy are supposed to be, then, the gold standard for natural law, which shows you that there is a domain in which you can be certain, and hence that you can be certain about the ethical principles that form part of natural law as well, providing you're suitably educated. Um, the upshot of this is that um, Melanchthon conceives of the mathematical structure of the world as divinely ordained, and he takes that rather seriously. He establishes two new professorships at Wittenberg specifically to teach mathematics. The people involved have names up here, and now here's the bit where I'm afraid I'm going to throw a lot of names at you very quickly. Don't worry about the names, just worry about the story. Um, the two new professors of mathematics at Wittenberg were Reinhold and Reticus. They were appointed in 1536. 
In 1538, Reticus asked for a leave of absence so he could tour around Europe and visit other mathematicians and astronomers. Actually, it's pretty clear that in addition to doing, as it were, a research trip, he was also looking for a better job. <laughs> um, in Nuremberg, he met um, a trio of very powerful Lutherans. Nuremberg was a free city which had converted to Lutheranism. He met an astronomer called Schoener, a printer of mathematical works called Petraeus, and um, a Lutheran uh, cleric, Oziander, um, who had been responsible not only for the conversion of the city, but also for the conversion of the first important aristocrat who had uh, embraced Lutheranism and imposed it on his domain. This was a gentleman called the Duke of Prussia. Now you can just see Prussia in this picture. It's all the way at the top and all the way at the um, right as you're looking at it. Um, just past that little triangle which is a different colour. Um, Schoener and Petraeus had somehow heard about Copernicus, heard that Copernicus had strange ideas. Um, they suggested that Reticus might like to go and visit him and see whether Copernicus was interested, for example, in having a book published by Petraeus. What made it irresistible, however, for Reticus, I believe, is that Oziander could give him an introduction to the Duke of Prussia. So, the following year, 1639, Reticus took himself off to the distant north, Frauenburg, where Copernicus lived. Um, in a tiny Catholic enclave, um, the lands of the Bishop of Varmia, completely surrounded by the lands of the now Protestant Duke of Prussia. Now, when he got there, he discovered a very unfortunate situation. Copernicus had no intention of writing a book. Um, uh, he'd actually been asked to do so by a very high um, Catholic functionary, a cardinal in Rome, um, several years before that, and had simply not got round to it. The cardinal had died. And to make matters worse, Copernicus was now being persecuted by the Bishop of Varmia, Dantiscus. Um, not entirely clear why Copernicus was being persecuted. He was accused of having improper relations with his housekeeper. Now, he was a um, uh, single man, as all members of the church were required to be. Everybody had housekeepers. Sometimes the housekeepers became more than just cooks and cleaners. Um, we don't really know whether that was true for Copernicus. What was true was that Dantiscus was using this sort of charge systematically to dispossess junior colleagues he didn't like, seize their property. So Copernicus was in considerable danger. He was in danger of losing his living. Um, he was uh, required to appear in court and answer these charges. Um, but before this could happen, Reticus arrived on the scene and suggested a way of saving the situation. The way of saving the situation was to appeal to the only aristocrat in the area who was clearly more powerful than the Bishop of Varmia, and that was the Duke of Prussia. So, um, an interesting story about uh, rapid composition. Between um, um, uh, May 1539 and September 1539, Reticus wrote a book. It was called The First Account. And it was a fairly technical, but not particularly mathematical, exposition of Copernicus's entire set of ideas. Um, he, he produced all this, having never seen any of it before May. Um, so this was a real virtuoso performance. Um, shows you how urgent producing this book was, for some reason. Um, the reason appears at the end of the book, which isn't technical astronomy at all, but an eight-page encomium to the lands of the Duke of Prussia. It starts with a very attention-getting shower of gold, and um, goes on from there to praise um, uh, the natural resources of the lands of the Duke of Prussia, the wonderful cities of the Duke of Prussia, and, oh, the wonderful people who live in the domain of the Duke of Prussia, including this really fantastic mathematician, Copernicus, who's expected to produce a book very soon. Well, um, the book's published instantly. It's published in the spring of 1540. Copies of it are showered on the Duke of Prussia. Uh, he immediately invites Reticus to his court, uh, where Reticus spends the next two years and makes maps for him and builds scientific instruments. And at the crucial instant when Copernicus is supposed to be appearing in court to answer the charges brought against him by Dantiscus, the Duke of Prussia demands that Copernicus appear also at his court 
and keeps him there right through the time when the trial is supposed to have taken place. So nothing happens. We don't actually know how all this worked out, um, except that um, uh, we don't have the letters from the Duke to Dantiscus, but we have a letter from Dantiscus to Copernicus immediately after he got back to um, Fraunberg, saying, um, come and see me before breakfast tomorrow, and we need to work this out in a way that will satisfy the Duke. After that, Copernicus heard no more bad things from Dantiscus, um, which is why we have this book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, the book in which Copernicus proposes um, the heliocentric system of the world. It's not dedicated to the Duke of Prussia, it's dedicated to the Pope. It doesn't mention Reticus in its introduction, it mentions the bishop who'd asked for it before, but look at the number of people directly involved in the appearance of this book who were Lutherans. Everybody on the screen, except for the two Catholics, Copernicus and Dantiscus at top right, were Lutherans. So, as far as starting the astronomical revolution is concerned, if it hadn't been for all these Lutherans and their wanting to know about astronomy, and in the case of Reticus in previous career, um, we wouldn't have a heliocentric system. Okay, so what did Copernicus say very quickly in his book? Um, this is probably what Copernicus looked like around the time he was writing the book. This is... Uh, um, Oh, what's the name of that awful TV show about um, um, cops in Las Vegas? CSI. CSI, right. This is a CSI reconstruction of Copernicus's face <laughs> based on a skeleton which was unearthed about 10 years ago. Um, okay, so this is probably what he really looked like. Um, all Copernicus does is to say, okay, here's Aristotle's universe, Ptolemy's universe with the Earth in the middle, the moon going round it, the sun going round. Let's swap the Earth and the Moon for the Sun. Everything else stays in place. So now we've got the Sun in the middle. The Moon is going around the Earth, fine. But everything else is just where it was. Um, of course, this is just showing you the gross structure. What we really want is the inner structure that I've shown you before, the things that move the planets. And there's every indication there that Copernicus would have used exactly the same system um, of orbs that I've already indicated. This is uh, one of the diagrams of planetary motion from the book. It doesn't show orbs, but it does show you very clearly a, uh, an eccentric, an epicycle, and in the middle, uh, the additional thing you need in Copernicus's system, because you're no longer viewing everything from a central Earth, you need an account of the motion of the Earth round the center of whatever the cosmos is. Um, now, it turns out the answer to that question is slightly embarrassing. Uh, Copernicus advertises himself as uh, providing you with uh, the sun as the center of the cosmos, but he doesn't actually manage that mathematically. Mathematically, the center of this system is a point called the mean sun, um, which I'll resist the temptation to explain the technicalities of. The physical sun rotates around it, put it that way. Um, the little epicycles here are still epicycles. They're not epicycles like the ones we were looking at before. They're not designed to make planets go backwards through space. Instead, this very small epicycle is a way of eliminating the equant, which, as a matter of fact, Copernicus borrowed without acknowledging it from earlier Islamic astronomers. But again, that's a story I'm not telling you tonight. Um, if we wanted to, we could draw in an orb system for Copernicus, just like the ones we've been using before. We'd also need to draw an orb system for the Earth, and it would have to be wide enough to accommodate the sphere carrying the moon going around the Earth. And if we do that, we see something rather peculiar. There's a gap. Now, I'm going to skip over here an argument for why Copernicus believes in orbs and simply move on to the gaps between his orbs, because that's the point. If you draw Copernicus's system to scale, you don't see a nice full universe with layers of the onion like the ones we've been looking at so far. For Copernicus, this would be the orb of Saturn, this would be the orb of Jupiter, this would be the orb of Mars, and so on going in. And there are huge holes between them. There's no explanation for that. In fact, Copernicus rather goes out of his way to divert attention from it. One of the things he's advertising is his ability to calculate planetary distances in a new way. So you'd expect one of the things in the book would be a table of planetary distances, put them all on one page so you can see them. 
He never does that. Um, if you extract those numbers, you find this. Um, and that may be why. So, um, Copernicus tries to change the cosmos. He shifts the center to the mean sum. He does get rid of equants, which are embarrassing, but he keeps eccentrics and epicycles, and he certainly keeps celestial orbs as well. The liabilities, however, far outweigh any of the assets. First of all, all this contradicts physics. Um, physics, for the last 2,000 years, has depended on the principle that, for instance, heavy bodies seek the center of the cosmos, which is the center of the Earth. If you put the Earth in motion around the sun, it's no longer the center of the cosmos, where a heavy body is supposed to be moving to. Um, accepting Copernicus's astronomical theories will require that you give up perfectly good explanations of why stones fall, why bubbles rise, and a host of other ordinary, everyday phenomena. Secondly, of course, um, the Catholic Church has also assimilated Earth-centered physics and astronomy to the reading of the Bible, and so this <coughs> idea that the Earth is in motion and the Sun is the center contradicts Scripture as well, uh, at least on obvious readings. The most famous passage is probably the uh, passage from Joshua, where Joshua commands the sun to stand still so that the Israelites can win a battle. Um, quite obviously, Joshua thought the earth was stationary and the sun was moving, not the other way around. Because so Copernicus is wrong. Last, however, there's this problem with the gaps. Okay, um, move on rapidly to the second generation of Lutherans. So um, Denmark became the first established nation to embrace Lutheranism, actually in 1536, the same time uh, Redicus and Reinhold were being appointed to their professorships. Um, Tycho Brahe, the next figure we want to talk about, was born into a very high level of the Danish aristocracy. Um, this um, is the only picture of Tycho Brahe you'll ever see sideways on. Um, because while he was a student, um, he couldn't go to Italy like Copernicus to finish his education because he was Danish and hence a Lutheran. So he had to confine his attention to Lutheran universities in Northern Europe like Wittenberg, um, also Leipzig, Rostock. While he was at Rostock, Rostock he got into, um, uh, well, um, a barroom brawl with another Danish aristocrat. Because they were both aristocrats, they were carrying swords, and before their friends could separate them, they went out into the courtyard and started laying at each other. Um, with almost the first blow, the other fellow, called Parberg, severed Tycho Brahe's nose flat with his face. Um, this was an appalling disfigurement. However, um, Tycho had a way of turning disadvantage to advantage. He was already seriously inter interested in astronomy, and uh, also in alchemy. So he constructed for himself, using alchemical knowledge, an artificial nose made out of gold and alloyed with copper and other things, so that it appeared a fairly natural pink color, was held in place with salve, and wore it for the rest of his life. That's what you're seeing here. So Tycho Brahe became the most famous astronomer in Europe, but most of my students remember him as the man with the golden nose. <laughs> He was unusually successful in attracting the um, support of the King of Denmark, who at that point was Frederick II. Uh, Frederick gave him an island in the middle of the sea between um, uh, Denmark and Sweden. This island, um, the only bit of Denmark that everybody knows about is right here. This is the castle Elsinore, where the hamlet took place. So this is within sight of the island. On the island, Tycho built um, what we would really think of as a large country house. He called it a palace, um, dedicated to the muse of astronomy, Urania. So it's called Uraniborn. Um, it was in a large and elaborate garden. And the house itself was a combination of an astronomical observatory and an alchemical laboratory. These things on the side. Um, which look rather like sort of martini glasses made of wood with um, tents on top. Those are platforms for holding observing instruments like these. Now, this is all before the invention of the telescope. So, observing instruments in astronomy are primarily for measuring angles, and the larger you can make them, the more accurate they are, because the more intervals you can get on the scale. Tycho made the largest and most accurate instruments anybody had made in Europe to that point. Um, if you were standing next to um, the one on the left, 
uh, your shoulder would be level with the bottom of the scale. Um, with these unusually large and accurate instruments, Tycho was able to observe a comet in 1577 and for the first time track its distance from the Earth over a series of months. Um, actually, one other person succeeded in doing the same thing. A uh, German, Michael Meistlin, who was about to become the teacher of Johann Kepler, they both agreed that the comet seemed to have started in the sphere of Mercury and disappeared, or they lost track of it, in the sphere of Mars. Now, that made absolutely no sense. The orbs that carried the planets were supposed to be rigid and impenetrable. Something like a comet shouldn't be able to travel through them. So Tycho um, puzzled over how this could be. It seemed that the Aristotelian arrangement of the orbs was just wrong. Meistlin suggested that the thing to do was to reorient the orbs on the sun, as Copernicus had suggested. And if you did that, you could put the comet in the gap between Venus and the Earth, which was nice. So maybe all those gaps were full of comets. But Tycho couldn't accept that. He couldn't accept it because of the physics. He couldn't accept it because of the scriptural arguments, which were common property of Lutherans. And he couldn't accept it because his instruments were so large and precise that he could tell exactly how far away the fixed stars would have to be not to have an observable stellar parallax. Um, so Tycho could establish the minimum distance of the fixed stars had to be 700 times further away than the most distant planet, Saturn. So what we have in the middle here is the sun in the middle, the planets and everything else in the green bit, and then a really big gap out to the fixed stars. Um, 700 to 1. Uh, maybe that's not embarrassing. Uh, it's a fairly large number. If you try and draw it to scale, it's really impressive. But remember, this is an all. We're talking about a spherical cosmos. So think about the ratio of the volumes here. In the middle of the cosmos is one volume which contains the sun, the earth, the planets, and everything out to Saturn. After that, you have 343 million volumes of nothing and then the fixed stars. Tycho said um, the universe couldn't be constructed that way. And the interesting thing is the way he put it. God would not have created a universe with so much wasted space. Um, this is not just a pious refrain. Um, he's a student of Melanchthon. He believes that God has created the law-bound part of the the physical part of the world, according to discoverable principles, because we're supposed to learn these things so that we can run our lives by them, among other things. So there is this, like a suppressed premise here that God is playing fair, but if God is playing fair, he wouldn't have built this cosmos, according to Tycho. So you see here a very direct um, uh, consequence of religious belief for understanding cosmology. This led Tycho to propose his own system in which the Earth is in the center, the Sun goes around the Earth, and everything else goes around the Sun. Now the problem with that is, if you um, carry everything with orbs, then the orb for the Sun and the orb for Mars have to intersect. And it was about 10 years before Tycho figured out that he could just give that up and replace the solid spheres of previous cosmology with um, a fluid substance of the heavens in which the planets directed their own motion. Um, like birds through the air or fish through the waters, the planets were supposed to be the natural creatures of the ether. So, um, by the end of his career, Tycho has wrought a couple of large changes. Um, he's shown that there are no celestial orbs. Uh, he's introduced a completely new um, cosmic scheme in which the Earth is stationary and central, the Sun goes around the Earth and everything else goes around the Sun. So in effect you get there the best of Aristotle and Ptolemy and also the best of Copernicus. Um, and of course Copernicus is still wrong. So how did Copernicus come out right? Um, while Kepler was finishing up his work in Denmark, uh, Johann Kepler was a young man um, teaching in Graz in southern Austria, and one day he was lecturing on how 
grand conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn, points where Jupiter and Saturn come together in the sky, move around the constellations from year to year. So, um, sorry, um, they move around like this. And as you see, as you draw in more, whoops, as you draw in more of them, um, you end up defining a circle inside the zodiac. Now, Kepler tells us when he saw that, he immediately thought of Copernicus's gaps. Except, of course, you can't use something like a triangle or a plane figure to define the gaps between the planets because uh, there are too many plane figures. Um, this is a diagram you already looked at, actually a diagram drawn by Meister and Copernicus to show the gaps. Kepler realized, however, if he went up one dimension, from two dimensions, triangles, squares, to three dimensions, pyramids and cubes, he had an interesting possibility. Um, because there are exactly five regular platonic solids. No more. It's been proved since antiquity that there can't be any more. Now, at this moment in history, remember I told you it was important that the planets ended at Saturn, there are only six planets. So there are only five gaps between them. Kepler's idea then is perhaps you can arrange the three-dimensional solids in the three-dimensional orbs so that you can inscribe or circumscribe orbs to produce the right gaps. Um, this was his big idea, and the answer is you can. Here is part of his picture showing how you do it. You start with Saturn on the outside, put a cube inside that, draw the orb for Jupiter inside that, put a pyramid inside that, draw the orb for Mars inside that, and so on. Now this all looks very clever. The question is, does it actually work when you look at the numbers? And here I apologize for showing you the table of figures. But um, here are the planets. Here are the greatest and least distances according to the polyhedral hypothesis and according to Copernicus. So this, if you like, is Kepler and this is Copernicus. And perhaps you could say, you know, none of this is perfect. This is pretty close. Um, some of these aren't too bad, um, but if you compare those figures with the figures in Ptolemy, the difference is immediately obvious, vast. So, um, Kepler quite rightly thought that he'd come up with a good idea. It was um, um, uh, apparently possible to get very close to the Copernican numbers, perhaps with a little more research you could get exactly right. And um, it was quite clear that Ptolemy's numbers, uh, the Aristotelian cosmos that we started with, the spacing there was completely wrong. Um, more importantly, the reasoning by which Kepler had arrived at this was based on pure geometry, calculations based on the regular solids, the polyhedra. Pure geometry is part of the natural law inscribed on our souls by God, so we know it with, I was going to say with the same certainty as God, well at least we know what God intended us to know about geometry. Um, so what was appealing to Kepler about this demonstration um, was not just that the numbers came out right, but also that you didn't have to make any <coughs> empirical assumptions. Uh, you could check up on it empirically with these numbers, but um, the original basis for it is certain and guaranteed by God, if you're a Lutheran. So, um, he writes a book called um, The Mystery of the Cosmos, uh, Mysterium Cosmographicum. <coughs> At least that's the way it's usually translated. I would suggest that um, a better translation would be The Sacred Mystery of the Cosmos, because um, at this moment, the word mystery actually mainly connotes mystery religions from the ancient world. If you're in any doubt about which uh, religion is being invoked by Kepler, um, on the very next page, literally over the leaf, there's an introduction to the reader which tells you that the point of the book is not just an astronomical defense of Copernicus, but to tell you God's motive and plan for creating the world, God's source for the numbers. And he says the same thing again on the first page of the preface. More interestingly, perhaps, on the last page of the book, the very last thing he says in the whole book is, uh, now, friendly reader, don't forget the aim of all this. 
which is understanding, adoration, and veneration of the Most Wise Maker. Therefore, join with me in singing a hymn. And I've given you the first and last lines of the hymn, both of which address the deity directly. So, um, historians of science who are not too keen on uh, the connection between science and religion have been inclined to um, read references like this as mysticism, personal uh, preference, um, uh, stage dressing, um, not essential to the work of, for example, establishing Copernican astronomy. Um, I want to insist, first of all, that nobody like Kepler in the 16th century would have taken the Lord's name in vain in a book on astronomy or anywhere else. And if he tells you the point of the book is that it's showing you God's plan for the world, that's what he thinks he's doing. Um, the sacred mystery that uh, Kepler reveals then is, first of course, that God used the five regular solids in determining the construction of the cosmos. But the real sacred mystery here is the second one. God is a Copernican. Um, Copernicus um, joins Tycho Brahe working for this interesting gentleman, the Emperor Rudolf II in Prague. Uh, Tycho dies under unfortunate circumstances which I'll resist the temptation to regale you with. Uh, Kepler goes on to publish a second important book on astronomy called The New Astronomy, in which he argues against the possibility of epicycles by showing you what an epicyclic motion would look like if tracked over time. This is the motion of Mars from 1580 to 1596, if it was carried by an epicycle and going around the Earth. Instead, Kepler, after a long mathematical uh, deliberation, arrives at the conclusion that the path of Mars is not actually even a circle, which is what everybody had thought so far, but instead an ellipse. We now call this the first law of planetary motion, Kepler's first law. It's shown in this not very um, impressive diagram as a dotted line inside the circle, which Kepler has been using for his calculations all through the rest of the book. Oh, and um, this is the sun down here at one focus. Um, however, you can see that Kepler realizes that finding the planetary motions or ellipses is important by looking at the little decoration that's been added to the figure. Um, it's difficult to see, so I'll blow it up. Um, this thing in the book is about the size of a postage stamp. Um, and I think what you see here is um, a lady in classical dress, riding in a chariot, sitting next to an astronomical instrument, an astronomical globe, and handing Kepler a laurel wreath. So, this is the muse of astronomy, handing Kepler a laurel wreath for having discovered the ellipse. So you how important he thinks it is. Back to where we came in, changing the universe, Copernicus and Kepler. Um, <coughs> Copernicus gets rid of equants. Kepler actually keeps them, oddly enough. In the ellipse, the empty focus is the ghost of the equant. Um, what about epicycles? Copernicus uses them quite freely, for example, to get rid of the equant. Kepler has arguments that you can't use epicycles. You've got to have a clean curve, something like a, an ellipse. Um, what about solid orbs to transport the planets? Again, for the reasons really given by Tycho Brahe, Kepler rejects that. Planets, according to Kepler, move freely through space, propelled by a force emanating from the sun. Um, is the Earth just like other planets? Well, for Copernicus, the answer is an embarrassing no. Other planets have epicycles and the Earth doesn't. Kepler treats the Earth just like everything else. It has an elliptical orbit, too. And perhaps most damning, is the sun really the center of the system? For Copernicus, the answer is no, it's this funny thing, the mean sun. For Kepler, however, he's able to show that the planes of all of the planets intersect in a single unique point, and that point is the body of the sun, the physical sun. So, in Copernicus, we have a new idea, heliocentrism, in a completely old-fashioned garb. Solid orbs move the planets, and eccentrics and epicycles are used to explain their motion. Uh, he doesn't even succeed in getting the sun really in the middle. In the case of Copernicus, we have planets move. Uh, case of Kepler, sorry, get the contrast right. In the case of Kepler, we have 
uh, planets moving freely through space, propelled by a force centered on the sun, um, uh, along elliptical orbits. Um, I didn't have time to mention that Copernic, uh, Kepler actually introduces the word orbit. Um, and the sun really is the physical center of everything. In other words, that's exactly what we believe today. Um, the modern version of Copernicanism, then, is entirely the work of Kepler, who grows out of the Lutheran tradition, and without which he wouldn't have said the things he said. To understand Copernicus, then, even the modern version, we should see it as coming out of Kepler. To understand Kepler, we should see it as coming out of the theological ideas of Philip Melanchthon. And um, without the Lutherans, there wouldn't have been an astronomical revolution, or indeed a scientific revolution. Thank you. All right, we have some time for some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will get this microphone to you. Uh, yes, Dr. Elke. Thank you very much for an uh, excellent presentation. Back in the uh, late 90s, I think it was, uh, a scholar named Toby Huff wrote uh, The Rise of Early Modern Science. Yeah, yeah I know the book intimately. <laughs> okay, well, well uh, actually, no, the one I know is the one about Islam in the West. Uh, well, this gets into that, that too, yeah. and I was going to ask you, um, he makes a point, and others have made it too, that uh, the university system that arose in the West during the uh, medieval period gave room for the use of reason, for the use of argumentation, exploration, and so on. Whereas you don't find that uh, in the Mid uh, Middle East or in the Far East in China. And um, Luther, among all of the reformers, seemed to have the best balance of the place of reason in regard to scripture as not the master but the servant of, of the word and so on. And I wonder if you could just uh, briefly comment on that as far as a distinction between, well, uh, the Muslim scholars took it so far, but they couldn't go farther. Right. And uh, Copernicus and Kepler did take I that have, extra I step. I have far too much to say about this, because this is actually one of the things I'm doing research on right at the minute. Um, I think I mentioned in passing that Copernicus stole some of his mathematical techniques from Islam. Um, okay, so I've, I'm very interested in um, science and Islam, and um, uh, the bottom line there is that don't trust Toby Huff. Um, the way people have talked about science and Islam falls into two or three uh, bad patterns. Some people simply deny there was any, that all that Islamic science did was to kind of translate and preserve Greek wisdom until it could be passed on to the Europeans who knew what to do with it. Um, another version, slightly more sophisticated, says, well, actually, they did do some original things of their own in the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, but it was all over by the 13th century. Now, um, there was a continuous tradition of mathematical astronomy in Islam, which made huge progress, starting in the 13th century and right up to the time of Copernicus. Indeed, the mathematical gadgets that Copernicus borrows to get rid of the equal problem and to produce better mathematical theories in astronomy than anybody in the West had seen before, were all developed in Islam, either in the 13th century or the 14th century. So um, the period of um, fertile work in Islamic science clearly extends well up into the European Renaissance. A better way of looking at what happened to the two cultures, I think, is provided by George Saliba in a recent book on um, Islamic science and the making of the European Renaissance, published in 2007. He suggests it wasn't Islamic science that died off or stagnated. About between 1500 and 1600, European science took off, accelerated away. Uh, Islamic science kept on doing what it was doing, a fully developed, rich scientific tradition, but it wasn't doing it as fast as people in Europe were doing it. So, um, and then, of course, being smart people, um, they reverse things. Um, I'm talking for too long, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but I did want to say that you know, they, they turned around and started studying us instead of us studying them, which is what had been going on right until the Renaissance. On the question of universities, a particularly interesting one. There's a brand new book with an absolutely awful title, Warriors of the Cloister. The, perhaps the title's memorable enough to find if you want to. 
um, in which the author, who is a philologist from Indiana, argues that um, not just the institution of the university, or rather the basis for the university, the college, but also the key method of medieval universities, the rational method of disputation, were both borrowed from Islam. Um, now, I would give Toby Huff um, a little bit of slack here, um, because the author of uh, Warriors of the Cloister will go at least this far. Uh, there is something unique about the um, European university tradition, um, that is the combination of the idea of a college, uh, special purpose endowment, which is borrowed from Islam, uh, and the idea of a corporation, which is where the faculty comes from. And combining those two things gives you the European university, which is a unique combination. Um, as for um, whether or not it's European universities which have uh, special uh, access to, or a special way of balancing the claims of reason, um, I really think uh, we just need to look at what happened in Islam more carefully. And we'll see that their scholars were just as brilliant as ours. It's just that after 1600, nobody was very interested because they were busy doing their own thing. Um, hope that helps. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Other, other questions? And I'll try and be briefer. <laughs> other questions, please, for Dr. Barker. History of science, science, theology. Gee, you all got put off when we're talking about Islam in the West. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I've been talking about Kepler um, producing the modern version of Copernicanism. This really happens in 1609. There's a good joke I should tell you. It's the only light bulb joke about Copernicus. And it's how many Copernicans does it take to change a light bulb? Any offers? Well, I'll spare you. The answer is less than 12 before 1610. So between Copernicus's book in 1543 and Kepler's book in 1609, less than a dozen people in the world actually accepted the position that we all accept today. <laughs> Giving you some idea of how the fuck. Comments, questions, please, please. It's not, not often that we get a scholar of this caliber uh, talking about uh, the Reformation of Science. Yes, Dr. Carrier. Since you've taken a look at the, the wide range about science, how would, what are a couple of points where you could contrast how science was done in, at the time of the Reformation as compared to how scientists do their thing today? What, what strikes you as most different or, 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 or something that, that's common? Um, well, there are two big things, and that's you usually point to is mathematics and experiment. Um, Kepler is interesting here because he's one of the people who is placing mathematics at the center of natural philosophy in a way that it hadn't been before. Um, so all of the earlier people I was talking about, um, even those who are trained in mathematical astronomy, would see natural philosophy as a primarily non-mathematical um, Obviously, having enough to talk about Galileo, uh, Newton, um, things get more mathematical as you go forward. Um, but uh, it's also important to look at the way in which um, experience or experiment is being understood. And we move from a period um, contemporary with Melanchthon and Luther where the view of experience or experiment is essentially the Aristotelian one. Um, that is, you can go off into a laboratory and you can do something that only happens once, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, experience only supports science if it's the regular course of nature. It has to happen all the time. Um, contriving to bring something about in a laboratory isn't the ordinary course of nature and hence has no evidential power. Obviously that changes. It changes after the time of Kepler. Um, it's people like uh, members of the early Royal Society in England who are important, although my wife is no doubt um, thinking uh, intensely at me that it's very important to also mention the role of artisans here, not just technical scientists. And, um, developing the idea that you can learn from experience in a way different from the way Aristotle would have wanted you to. 
So those are the, the, the two highlights I would have picked up on. All right, any other other questions? Yes. Well, thank you again. Uh, at some point, I'm not a historian, right, but at some point there's going to be problems for the church at large where we come to this point where this integration of science and faith is done too much, right, where we start reaching that the church is arguing against the fixity of the species with Darwin uh, and making these claims. <coughs> and I'm wondering if you would say that Melanchthon's uh, talking about natural law being the same when it's in your morals or when it's in the observations of nature, if that's going to be contributing to the conflagration of science and theology in a way that becomes damaging to the church later on. Um, I don't think any of this is inherently damaging. Um, I think it's up to you to negotiate how this works. Um, you know, in the case of Melanchthon, um, it wasn't so much um, experience that was going to teach you. Um, in the end, it was what was a great on your soul. That was why Kepler was so pleased with his proof, because he didn't need to go outside the domain from, with certainty in mathematics, which he believed he knew because God had put it there. Um, now, you don't necessarily have to believe that, um, you know, that the creative deity hardwired your soul with certain knowledge. Um, to think that um, you can learn a great deal about the creative deity from inspecting the creation. And I think that's the fundamental message of all these people. It's sometimes described as the two books um, doctrine. Uh, one book is the book of scripture. We all know what we're supposed to learn from that. The other book, which is studied by people like Kepler and his successes in the sciences, is the book of nature. And from studying the book of nature, you learn about the creator of nature. All right, any other comments or questions? Join me again in thanking uh